Master Xeon here and in this video we're going to go over the process of how I created this particular head starting off with just a UV sphere. Um, now I'll take it through quite a modeling process of sculpting and polygonal techniques through a process I call um, I forgot the name sorry but anyways so I took it a couple of different directions and created this mask animation for it. While I don't go over the creation of the mask, I just thought I'd show y'all just in the introduction. But basically it's a mask that just slides off that I created just while uh, goofing off today. But, you know, without further ado, let's go ahead and begin and I'll be able to explain to y'all the process in which I create the head that's behind the mask. Let's begin. Alright, so jumping in, uh, first thing I do is turn on the screencast keys, you know, change the parameters there, and I drop in an icosphere by giving it 12 and then aligning it to view, applying the rotation, cutting it in half, and then applying a mirror modifier. I'm able to begin getting the you know, shape of the head. So this particular study, my goal was to make a uh, decent head without using reference images or anything like that. However, I do end up using one reference image that you'll see me go through throughout the video. But lately, my goal has been to try to come up with more unique ways of coming up with a head. Usually I come in, start shaping something, dynamic topology, run all the geometry and just be dealing with just a geometric mess and the results I'd get would be all right but with polygonal modeling you definitely get more control so this is something I guess I would consider fusion modeling or something like that but Basically, I'll be modeling to an extent that I'll be sculpting the geometry. I'll add no multi-res or apply any subdivisions. And that way, I'll just have, you know, edit mode to control the verts and add geometry. And then, instead of object mode, I'll have sculpt mode to help me even control it further. Because, you know, the advantages of using the sculpt brushes instead of edit mode is that you do have you know that fall off already given to you in the strokeage on the screen so that's pretty grand so by using the bevel tool I'm able to just cut in shapes and begin just begin indicating the profile so my goal lately has been to do one human head a day or at least one human head a day for based off of references and then one human head based off of memory so while doing this, I've definitely noticed quite a few things in my own technique of modeling heads. One is that it, when following images, it's real easy to let the angle of the picture determine your overall image. So, you know, whenever it comes to references, not to say that references are bad, but references can definitely be misleading and it's easy to have that happen. So in case you're not familiar with my modeling technique, usually I go through with the knife and cut things until it begins to look the way I want it to. And in this video, it is no exception. So the worst thing about the knife is whenever you snap and create doubles at, at uh, midpoints and you aren't aware that they're there and the knife tool just doesn't work again because there's two verts so you can't connect anything. That's just something that drives me crazy, but removing doubles can take care of that, but you'll see me deal with that quite a bit throughout this video. So that is the downside of modeling like this. But as you can see, I've basically have used the bevel and knife tools to cut into place the geometry to begin to add complexity in the areas that I'm currently working on. So it works out a lot as far as forgetting the features I want to to fit within certain geometries and not be obtrusive to the surrounding areas. But I will tell you in advance, you won't see me modeling air here. Sometimes 
I just don't feel like it. And in this video, I didn't. So I just drop in an air, used a bridge, and called it a day. So if you're not familiar with that, then you should definitely go back and watch my kit bashing video where I talk about um, using pre-built parts to comprise assets to you know, rapidly expedite the creation process. But with these heads, I've definitely gotten a lot better. But I can tell you that following reference images to an extent can be helpful, but relying on them is not a very good idea. After a trial of fire of making several heads in progression, I began to see the error of my ways. And while my main goal is always going to be to be able to model heads freely without reference images and to be able to make realistic people without any sort of textures from external sources, you'll continue to see these heads be just a little off, but I'm getting closer every day, learning more of the rules and measurements. And through these videos, I hope to share that with you. Sometimes I worry that these videos may not explain the process well enough to beginners, but based off of the renders that I see, it's, I think it's the understanding this whole technique of modeling is just one of those things that comes after a while once you begin to understand how geometry works with each other and what subdivision. Because you see me somewhat trying to go for the topology to be right here, but just know that I don't care. My goal is to get it to look the way I want it to look, so the final render looks the way I want it to. If I want the topology to be perfect, then I can retopologize or I can correct this. But I like this way of modeling because it's, I, th I feel it's like a test. I am having to figure out which ways to cut and dice to get not only the plans that I want, but also it in the simplest form while still cooperating with the geometry surrounding it. So if you're not familiar with the knife tool, you should definitely get in there and try to hack something together. Because all throughout this, you'll see me use the bevel and the knife. I was originally going to make this video of me modeling a devil character and call it the, the bevel inside of us, but this seems like a much better idea. So right here is another geometric quiz. The goal was to get the loop to go all the way around the inner mouth area. Because since the areas above the mouth area are simple, I'm able to control it very easily just by beveling. And bevel, GG slide, GG slide. And now there's rings surrounding the outer perimeter of the mouth for me to connect. But I will say at this point I should have split the mouth. But I didn't. But I should have. And with more loop cuts added, keep in mind that the loop cuts generally will span all of your contiguous edge loops unless you break the edge by subdividing it or dissolving it but subdividing it's a little easier since it doesn't break it and from there you can actually stop a loop cut from going all the way around the perimeter and you'll see me use that a lot throughout this too so while I say I don't care about geometry that still doesn't mean that um, it still doesn't have its uses now by following the geometry um, by having the geometry follow the muscle structures that um, are around the, that, you know, follow the muscles of the mouth, I'm able to be able to sculpt and move this area to control it a lot easier. So instead of just, you know, crossing it with quads and trying to call it a day, I am trying to get somewhat the topology of the, you know, the nasal loop that's dominant and well done models that allows the um, facial animations to be conveyed a lot easier just through proportional editing. Sorry if I'm talking myself into a hole. I'm also um, reading my email at the same time. I should probably stop. But continue on. So I add in an eyeball. I just, in order to get my 3D cursor where I want, I selected a vert at the top of the eye and at the bottom of the eye 
and then snapped the cursor there with Shift S. Then I inserted the sphere there, scaled it down, and then joined the sphere with the head, which mirrored it. Then I went to edit mode, selected the sphere with P, pressed L to separate it. I mean, pressed P to select clicked on a vertice or hovered over the sphere and then pressed L to select it, press P to separate, and then from there I was able to make it a separate object with the mirror mod. So now I'm actually using the mirror projection, I mean not mirror projection, the uh, magnet projection of the snapping with face project to project the shape of the eye onto the eyeball. And so this will allow me to get a shape true to the eye with very little effort. But I have a problem. My edge loop that I'm trying to add in here with Shift R is not contiguous. So here you'll see me make a series of solutions involving triangles to quads in order to make them fit and be contiguous. What could be causing this mystery? Secret doubles? Possibly. But I get it sorted out very quickly. All right, I'm back. Had to run out and grab something to drink. So continuing on with the model. So now I'm just trying to get the shape of the eye. Just thinking in my mind, you know, the plans that I'd normally be trying to get with sculpting. My goal here is to get with geometry. So think of it as poly modeling, but also realize that I'm thinking in terms of sculpting because all the forms that I'm trying to go for here are planar. So all the movements on the X and the Y or all to get a certain type of planar shape in an area of the face. So the model will spend quite a while looking hideous, but by the end I think the end result was actually pretty nice. And this is actually my second attempt at making this video because the first one was a bit of a failure. I think the character came out looking very Disney, just too Disney. But you know, while I'm here lecturing, I can't say that 3D is a lot like MMO. Speaking of which, um, I actually took a break from playing PSO because it was consuming too much time. But doing 3D every day, seeing your results, you know, every work you create either builds your confidence as an artist or takes away from it. Or at least these are just my theories and philosophies on it just in my adventures but me personally I go by something called I guess confidence of a pen where basically sometimes I pick up my pen and I just can't make anything it's like horrible writer's block you know I just can't make anything but my goal is to train myself to where I can pick up my pen anytime and be able to sculpt a person be able to model a house be able to create an asset just at a moment's notice without you know any sort of work being required for it to warm up like I don't have to watch a tutorial to get my brain running or anything like that I'm able to just get in there and just start creating whatever it is that I'm thinking of but there are a lot of times where I pick up the pen I just don't believe in what it is that I'm modeling or I just don't see it vividly enough in my head because I'm free modeling or I didn't look at reference images or whatever the case may be but I do want to let y'all know that you definitely improve with practice even though personally I think my progress sometimes comes so slow that I don't even see it happening. But I think this is one of them, um, this is a moment in which I do see 
that my skill has definitely improved substantially as a result of a intensive study. So lately I've been doing these studies of just various things, um, and the study is just a matter of just focusing on it directly without any sort of production purpose or plan for it, or at least that's my impression of what it means. So it sounds like nonsense, but I hope, you know, I got the point across, said that right. So with the lips, they have a very, very particular shape. And it's not like this, but I am going for a particular look. And as you can see, I've already broke the continuity that I had going on the inside, which I was trying to go for. And here I am trying to get it back with the knife tool. Didn't know I had so many loops not working out. And I know you look at this model and you're like, oh my god, it tries. But I'm not even that worried about coming back to it. In fact, I'll add a sub D modifier. And as long as there's not doubles or triple bevels happening at a vertice, it'll look fine and the end result will also look fine. But as far as animation goes, retop polish may be required. But this is, like I said, a poly sculpt. Right here I consider myself cheating. The goal of this modeling is to not delete any vertices, to just, to just cross them and cut them and join them but mainly not ever delete them. And so right here I felt I cheated, but I was just filling that hole. But I almost look at modeling like it's a game sometimes. Like, can I model this using only this technique? Or can I use it without even using this one tool at all? And most of the time I just give in. I'm like, you know, F it. I do need the bevel or I do need the loop cut tool. But, you know, sometimes it's I like a challenge. So here you see me bring in my first reference image, a picture I found on the internet of standard facial proportions. I wish I had the link for it, but it was just the notes in the student's paper. But these rules are pretty much saying that the eyes are where they need to be, the nose is halfway between the eyes and the chin, the mouth is one third of the distance between the nose and the chin, the distance between the eyes is equal to the width of one eye, the corner of the mouth line up with the center of the eyes, the top of the ears line up slightly above the eyes in line with the outer tips of the eyebrows, and I'm sure the people watching this can read. But these rules are for you know general human face modeling so I spent quite a bit of time looking at sculpts that are pretty horrible and I'm sure you know they're done by people who are very new to software but I am committed to helping y'all improve your facial modeling skills and to establish Blender as a excellent character modeling software suite but You know, most of the work is in the proportions, and then the last percent is just making sure that all the pieces connect together and look like, you know, there's anatomy underneath attaching it, that there's muscles and cartilage, bone. And, you know, in a lot of these beginner sculpts, you see that they just look blobby, that there's not any indication of a cheekbone or a zygomatic or a temple or a skull. And these are things that I've been guilty of as well. And even in previous videos, I like going back and just comparing how I've done it then compared to now. And while the techniques haven't changed drastically, I am glad that poly polymodeling hasn't been completely replaced for me since I do spend quite a bit more time sculpting now.
All right, so a common critique I get online is that I tend to make my eyes too large on my characters and they look astonished or scared. So after some comparisons between my characters that I create and astonished and scared characters, I have seen the light there. So I do go through quite a bit of rejoining the eye to the head and then separating the eye from the head because while sculpting, I do not want to modify the eyeball I do want to keep it a sphere shape, but I do want to scale the eye socket and scale um, the eyeball at the same time. So the way I do that is select the eyeball and then just select a couple of the inner loops of the eye socket and then scale it down. And the way that I go through the sculpting process is I'll add a shape key, pin that shape key, compare the changes. If I consider it an improvement, I'll apply it. If it's not an improvement, then I'll slide it back to normal or till I feel that it looks right. Or even just select a particular vertex group and set the shape key to be a region, then apply it. But either way, shape key sculpting is definitely one of the advantages to this particular style of modeling that I'm showing you here. By being able to cycle back through the changes, I get a level of versatility that I'm not given with dynamic topology. And with ZBrush, um, the undo history just isn't that versatile. But by adding loop cuts and knifing things, that can make the shape keys a little complicated. But as you'll see, it's nothing that becomes atrocious. So with the neck area, I always go through a little bit of effort to indicate certain features even if the features are looking wrong like they are here but I do correct it and also begin including the uh, collarbone just to give this uh, a little more indication and that way it's not just a head floating in space so it was more like a bust But with all these heads, I just stack them up, compare them, and once I have this process perfected, hopefully I won't have too big of an army of mutants in the process of learning it. But my goal is to get, the, get this down within a thousand heads. So with the sculpting and the smooth brush, in this particular style, the smooth brush can hurt you quite a bit, but it can also help you quite a bit by relaxing certain areas. You can get rid of creases that you're creating during the modeling stage that you would normally have a hard time removing during the modeling stage. Um, but you can also completely devastate what you got and turn it into blobs. So do know that I take quite a bit of care in avoiding it and I do press G quite a bit to switch between uh, the grab brush and the polish brush. Now the inflate, I actually pressed A in sculpt mode and set that to be anchored so that way instead of drawing strokes I'm actually pulling away from where I click and it will begin bulging that area allowing me to basically bulge what I want. So the geometry is not great, but the head is looking better. But it still has no ears, and no hair, or brows, and there's still some size issues, and the lips have a worried look. So when it comes to the lips, it's something that I still do struggle with quite a bit, since it is a very complex area. Sculpting, I think I'm pretty good at it, but polymodeling is definitely not very easy for lips, especially if you're going for a more complex look like I am here. But as far as the lips go, they are built up of, I believe, four pieces, and once you correctly identify them plainly, then it's a lot easier to deal with. And so I began trying to deal with the air area, and 
like I said, while I don't care heavily about the geometry, I do at least want the result to be somewhat all right. So here I am making a loop that'll go around the air and then under the chin. And so this is a pretty famous loop that's also in well-created models that just connects it all properly. But it's all just so I have an a level of control to add bevels and also to sculpt with. But notice that the geometry is only dense in the areas that I'm currently sculpting. So instead of having loop cuts spend the whole area of the model and make everything dense unnecessarily giving me problems I have to deal with later in the back of the head, I can nip all that in the butt now and just gradually take the model to fruition. Here's a situation where there were some secret doubles created. So in order to remove it, all I had to do was just use the lasso select and just merge them all. However, the loop that I created, unfortunately, connected the wrong areas. So I'll knife across, join. And the mystery is solved there. So now I at least have the form indicated that I want to and the geometry there to back it up with a tr support try to deal with later. And more shaping, you know, don't want a big nose. So I'll sculpt it, and then I'll poly model, go in, smooth it out a little bit, make the geometry look right by GG sliding it to interpolate between these edge loops a little bit better. And then just go in and sculpt it. So this is what I meant when I said I jumped between edit mode and sculpt mode. So I'm not saying that, you know, this technique is replacing my usual method of just making base meshes and then using dynamic topology, but you definitely have a lot more control using this method than the ones that I've used previously in other videos. And so now we're almost 30 minutes into this. I'm starting to wonder if I should have sped up some more of this. But it is at already at 300%. So in my asset massive, I'll just grab an air using control C in the other file, applying the shape key and removing it. I will control V, drop the air into the blend file. and you know make everything kind of fit so while i understand the rules of where i'm supposed to be placing the air i did choose a more personalized arrangement as far as going for the placement and when i tried to flip all the normals it for some reason flipped it the wrong way so I went in and W flipped normals manually and after hiding that edge loop I am able to put the air where I need to and try to adjust its proportions. Now whenever I connected I used 
W bridge edge loops with shell supports an uneven number of edges on either side. So that is fantastic. I've always dreamed of that and now we actually have it. So with that dropping ears on a dropping ears on a sphere is nothing. And I mean you could drop ears on a sphere and then from there use proportional editing, shape it like a head, just go in sculpting and you will be surprised with how fast you will get, begin getting somewhere. So I think that, you know, this particular method is definitely good for beginners, but the only way you'll be able to get this right is to make sure that it looks right on all sides. And just keep rotating, keep tweaking, but most importantly, use your shape keys and compare your changes. And you can see the improvement grow, you can slide it in and out. It's like having an undo slider telling you the shape keys are great. And I'm back. And so here we see me scaling down the eyes, pulling them in, pulling the ears in, Skeleton is all right, just making sure my fall off is correct and making sure that the head is looking the right amount of thickness from the side. Alright, so this is an important part. So, this is where I create the creases for the eyelids. And the way that I did it was by selecting these loops, Control P, beveling, and then adding a loop cut and then scaling that loop cut in. And I do it for the top as well. And separate the eyeball, of course, so that way. I can proportionally edit without fear of messing it up and sculpt it without fear of messing up the sphere. But it's definitely important when doing this that you become familiar with joining and separating and all of that whenever you're using this process because you'll be using it quite a bit. I mean, one of these days I'm going to come back make a video showing me inserting a sphere, drawing the shape of an eye, using a knife project to project it, and then with a little bit of work making it into something realistic. That is my goal. But I'm sure that heads aren't supposed to be as much work as they were previously. But as you can see, the result is definitely beginning to get a lot better. I'm trying to work on the mouth area. And I compare the changes. And by sliding these particular loops, I'm able to even it out and lessen the amount of creasing on it. And there's just something about those lips I don't like, so I just keep coming back to them. Now things are beginning to get more serious. So I just always add an edge loop on the lips and then just by pushing those two edges together I'm able to get that particular indicator crease that is uh, dominating of the nose, I mean of the lips. And with the brow I also just added a bevel. 
and it's a bevel going nowhere. It ends at tries, I can turn them to quads. But with these two things, I think the face improved by about 20%. So still working on that eye shape. And now I'm working on a crease for the side of the mouth. And by sliding edges at each other, creasing is actually pretty easy. So there's another advantage of polymolin using this method. And I'm just inserting edge loops, sliding them at each other, establishing connections. And comparing the changes. So now is the first mistake I made in the video, and that is thinking I was done. So this head is looking all right. I've been working on it a long time. It was looking all right when it was almost a sphere still, and so as a result. I'm not in the right mind and I'm not fully aware that there's still a long range of improvements needing to be made with it. And this is something that I think us as artists do quite a bit and that is just mistakenly let our eyes fall asleep on a model and forget the details that we need to indicate in order to get the last 30% that conveys the feeling of the model. So, I do come back with the part two, which explains why this video is so long, and make the necessary corrections that plague my eyes now when I look at it in retrospect. But with modeling, sometimes it's good to take a break from the lighting, me from the modeling process, and just play with rendering and lighting to just loosen up your mind and look at your model in a, excuse the irony, different light. So whenever it comes to making skin, usually I'll start off with a diffuse and then I'll create like a pseudo SSS type material and basically I'll just use a facing layer weight on a multiply node to just multiply a little bit of red just on the edges of the model. And then I add in a glossy and a noise and my goal here is to create the illusion of skin pores. So I'll scale it up, see how they look. That's more like freckles. And so it's just multiplying. So with the skin, lately I've been experimenting with a combination of simplifying my texturing process using procedurals and vertex paint. Vertex paint to establish base colors and of course get that very fantastic and useful dirty pass and just procedural textures. So also a part of the skin is the gloss so you'll see me go through and add a glossy texture and then from there, try to modify the roughness of it using a noise texture in order to give it a skin appearance. And so I'll play with the normal note a little bit to try to get some decent results, but I was pretty sure that I was using this note incorrectly, but that still didn't stop me. I mean, once I was looking at that, I was pretty sure I was using something incorrectly. this result will do. So now here you see me modifying the roughness using a normal to try to get that broken specularity that you see on human skin. All the while previewing it. And with that I have a pretty decent 
starter skin material just to have until it, you know it's time for SSS. And on the forehead, there's a very large crease I see that was caused by two loops being close together. So I'll definitely be sliding that out. I insert an HDRI image to add more complexity to the reflections that have been given to the surface, as well as just add a little more to the lighting. And so with these, I'll try out a variety of different ones. Um, whenever you're using multiple HDRIs, it's important to make sure that you have it set to equirectangular or mirror ball, depending on which one you're using. And if you're not setting it to the right one, then you could end up with some artifacting caused by the outer fringes of whatever HDRI you're using. So you'll see that happen here, but I won't know for a moment because... I've already used a mix with a is camera ray to hide the HDRI from the render so I can use a gradient with a color ramp on another background in order to change it to what I want it to be. So three quarters with a camera set to 80 millimeters is my usual set up for character modeling. That's something that I believe Angela Gannett talks about in her uh, Blenderella DVD. And so whenever it comes to vertex paint, you can press Shift, A, Shift K and it will fill your object with that color. And so I lower the intensity and if you select certain edge loops in face mode, you can also click that little button at the bottom that says use face selection mode and you can just fill an area using just shift K so using the power of your ge geometry you're able to have quite a bit of control over your texture painting process and this is something that I think also applies towards painting on UVs but I don't think the shift K actually works with that with texture paint and so with vertex paint I really feel that the colors I need for painting a face don't have to be so complex. Usually, I, wore, I used to back in the day go back and use photo references and project paint and go for that. And while you can get a photorealistic result, you are, of course, using a photo. And like I said, my goal is to be self-sufficient as far as my modeling, which requires that I use no external images. And so by using a attribute node and then typing in COL, which is the name of the um, particular data path of the vertex paint, I'm able to call it into the editor. And by using color, add it over the colorization map I've already created using that combination. And voila, now I have a decent looking skin material. But with the blending modes, I've been experimenting with different ways of adding, blending, and subtracting them to try to simulate the uh, subdermal, epidermal, and dermal layers of the skin. But my, of course, goal above that is to make it render even quicker than using SSS because SSS is definitely a render breaker. Same with hair. You'll see me make hair in this video, and the hair just absolutely begins killing my render times. Right now, 50 samples, 150 samples, actually, 150 samples, I would say I'd get this render back in less than a minute. If I use SSS, 5 minutes. If I use SSS in hair, 20 minutes. Depending, and if I optimize the settings, 10 minutes. But that still is a lot of more minutes than I want. So I'll actually abandon uh, fur hair and go with polygonal hair. But as you can see right here, I've exposed a HRI for what it is, and after correcting it, now I have beautiful, beautiful reflections happening in the scene.
So whenever I'm admiring the sculpts of humans on Zebra Central, they'll generally have these particular eyeballs that'll be spheres with this this shape to them. And in grayscale mode, you can still see indications of the pupils, and they just look really nice. I've always just thought of them as anesthetically pleasing. And so here's where you'll see me try to create those sort of eyeballs, just something that will just register and render as having a pupil instead of just being solid white like the eyes of Scorpion from Mortal Kombat and look more like a soulless doll. And this is where the video could have ended, but instead we're going to go ahead and continue. So the show must go on. And as this thing renders on, looking better and better, just grinding and grinding. Go ahead and pause that. Save the file, of course, and jump into part two. So after looking at the model so long, I neglected to notice that the model had an oinker nose, causing it to get much ridicule. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and correct that immediately. And after correcting the nose, now we're going through making some very much needed corrections on the mouth. So with this head, I'll admit that I was not completely pleased with the appearance that it was coming out with from the side. So I go through and make a couple of adjustments there as well. However, I think near the end, even though I wasn't completely pleased with the final result, I chose to accept it since I did end up adding hair. Which is definitely a large thing to put on a model for establishing its appearance along with eyebrows. Which is something I've always taken for granted before I always figured if I could get it looking good, poly in, then it's worthy of adding eyebrows. But sometimes the eyebrows are needed to help convey the form to just even help you get through the making of the model. So in light of the improvements, now you can see how bad the truly no how bad the nose truly was before. However, I do have to go back 
and added the profile from the side since the nose is kind of bulbous now. And there we go. So since there's no references used, I pretty much use my imagination for um, configuring the shape of the head. So of course that means I was probably wrong and thus those corrections had to have been made. So I try to take a par portion of geometry, duplicate it, cut it, and I'll go ahead and just add hair. And you'll see me play with hair for just a moment before getting rid of it, but I just, I'm still going to go ahead and include this so y'all can just see the process I went through with it, and as well as the material in case you decide that you want to kill your GPU and increase your rendering times trifold and all of that just for some nice looking hair. So when it comes to hair, a couple of tips. Some of the things I learned much later in my Blender adventures that I wish I knew previously was whenever it comes to hair, the defaults do give you too many. 1,000 strands is quite a bit. Using much less can make it a lot easier to deal with in comb. And then under, never underestimate the power of children. But whenever it comes to making hair, vertex groups are definitely underestimated. By white painting vertex groups, you can control the length of hair, you can control the density, you can control where it goes, neg negate and do the opposite of what the group originally was intended to do, or tune it to have a certain intensity. So with all those things, you actually have quite a bit of control over hair so I mean if you're using hair and you're not getting anywhere with it then you may want to you know step back and re-examine it but with hair the fewer strands you use the easier it is to deal with the more segments your hair has the more control you have over its bend so these are things that are also essential for it but also children so the difference between simple and interpolated is something worth clicking the buttons to find out. But usually I tend to stick with interpolated since it 
creates a more even amount of hair between every strand and simple requires uh, more parameter tuning in order to get it to be um, distributed throughout the model and then also when interpolated you have your kink options at the bottom where you can put radial wave or braid and those can get you some pretty cool effects especially on your second and third layer of hair but for this particular model as you can see the render times just got too high and as I sat there watching I began to realize that I can do a lot different and I should probably just reevaluate the look that I'm going for as well as determining whether or not I need realistic hair and the answer was no so I deleted the hell out of it and whenever it comes to modeling and rendering these are things you should also take into consideration is that there are certain render times you should be able to expect and so with your computer it's good to kind of benchmark your performance with certain scenes so you can have a good idea of what's normal because I know with the old one sometimes you could have a, a lead finger and slide the samples too high on a shadow buffer value for a spotlight and suddenly your render times are jumping up far too high for it to make sense and part of 3D is knowing that so with hair it wasn't worth it so I decided to also go back and do some reshaping of the eyes however as she got more mood line I began to worry about it but I definitely see a retrospect that I could have probably have done with scale in the eyeball just a little bit more so whenever you're rendering you can press F12 and render you can press J and it'll jump to another render slot now you can you can change your render slots and render again and therefore have separate renders on your render buffer that you can then compare the results for but will be lost unless you save them when you exit blender or blender crashes more than likely blender will crash but it's definitely powerful as far as helping you compare your previous to your next ones instead of just saving all the images and using windows image viewer or something but Jay will jump forth through them in the render panel I um, mean, in the UV image editor, it turns to a render window, and then J will jump through them, and Alt J will jump back through them. And then F3 will save the image, in case you didn't know. So poly hair, poly hair is an art in itself, an art I haven't truly mastered, but I'm still working hard towards. Now, whenever it comes to making hair, um, you could always go with fur, but like I've been saying this whole time, it definitely adds to those render times, and that's something I don't have time for, especially if I'm trying to render out 120 frames or 88,000. So. Usually I just stick with poly hair and with poly hair I'll turn on the face magnet and snap it to the surface of the head and then use Alt S to scale it out 
so you'll see me do that quite a bit but also try to create some perimeter loops that I can then hide and then use the inflate brush with the anchor and I can just pull it back out nicely without a whole lot of effort and after adding a subsurf and a smooth this will just be the base hair underneath just delete it and I will connect these manually And now for the harder part, the poly hair. So with the poly hair, I'll start out with a plane, align it to view, rotate it to fit, just cut and dice, and with the power of magnet, just extrude it around the head and shrink while shrink wrapping it, and just put it exactly where I want. And if this process works, why not repeat it here? and why not just select an edge loop and repeat it here so it is fairly basic but it's something that I still am practicing at so hopefully someday I'll be able to show you all some very 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 fantastic poly polygon hair but in the meantime you'll have to deal with this result And that's all there is to it. Just layering them up on top of each other, scaling them out. It's all snapping to the head. So as long as I just am looking at the head underneath it, whenever I'm touching the geometry, it'll stay exactly where I need it. And then I could just add a solidify and flip all the normals, make sure they're facing the right way. And you know, it starts looking pretty good off the bat. However, they are stuck to the scalp and I need them to be off of the head so with all of these edge loops I pretty much extruded them to the same area and that is in the center of the head I mean in the back of the head in that area where you see everything converging and that is so they'll all have a connection point whenever they're scaled off of the head so the workflow I use for this is pretty basic and was probably the easiest way to go about it. And while the back of the head won't be seen a whole lot for this model's intended purpose, I'll still put some polygonal clumps there anyways. So we have only 20 minutes left together, so if you've made it through this video, you too have won another Master Xeon gold medal. But I try to not make these as any longer than they have to be, so you know, I won't be starting out with a slideshow just yet, unless I'm going over something pretty important. And in order to get more knowledge and technique in there, 
they'll always be sped up now. Depending, of course. But I mean, if y'all prefer these videos in real time, we could definitely, I could definitely upload a four-part, I mean, a um, four-hour video showing this in real time. But I don't think seeing it step by step would explain it better than just understanding the reason and why it was done the way it was done, and just just seeing it spammed repeatedly throughout the use of the model. So now, the hair sticks out like Chiquita Banana, so we'll fix some of these areas.
since they're curves just by nature they start out with a lot of geometry so by going into the curve panel I was able to slide down the resolution for it and therefore reduce the amount of geometry it would take up uh, just having curves as the eyelashes and then using mirror modifier put them on the other side of the face so I tried scaling up the hair to see how it looked it looked very Rastafarian so I decided not to go with that and just go down the tips. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was watching a video on my iPod. Alright, so now I'm in the render view in local mode, just looking at the eyeballs again. So now I decide I want to go ahead and add a little bit of colorization to them. So with some quick vertex painting, I'm able to just bring in the attribute and just put that underneath the red that's added over it and the yellow. And so now I have eyeballs. However, they may need to be rotated a little bit so it looks. So they'll look less dirty, but it'll work. And so with the hair, I try to add a little bit more uh, randomness to it. But it still has enough randomness. I ended up going back and making some further changes to it. But with the hair, you know, you don't want it to be too uniform. And of course, have something in mind whenever you're making it to kind of go for. And I turned on some render passes because I intended to do some compositing, but due to the length of the video, I decided against it. So another thing you notice is that I also use the RGB curve on the HDRI. Y'all should definitely try that out sometime, especially if you want a little bit more control over some of the highlights and dark areas, or just to inject a particular color into your scene while still having... Um, rich and dynamic lighting. So now I'm trying to paint a little pink area around the eyes to indicate that. And then there's this little piece that you see in the corner of the eyes that I never model. So in this video I actually decided to go through and model it. And since I use vertex painting, the vertex paint data doesn't get affected horribly by the addition and modification of the geometry. So that's another advantage of using that. And that loop worked out just fine, so I decided to keep it. And as you see, I'm adding geometry, modifying it, redirecting, merging things, and I don't have to go into UV editor and correct it. Not to say that you shouldn't use UVs, but for this particular style of modeling, you wouldn't want to use you use UVs since the model isn't actually complete geometrically but it's complete enough for me to make a render of it and that was the goal of making it this way it's just a study Alright, so now things are looking much better.
if whenever it comes to vertex paint, sometimes with the subdivision on, it can be a little tricky in order to paint it, but it's something that once you turn it off, it becomes a lot easier. Or if you just know where your verts are that you're painting because you're only able to paint on top of the verts, it becomes a little bit easier. And so with that, the model is nearing completion, or at least as far as I intended to go with this particular study. But usually when modeling these, I plan to spend about an hour or two working on it, and then depending on how I feel, I'll texture it or go through this particular method for poly painting it before just adding it to the collection of heads that I already have. But in the end, I decided to make some final adjustments. And then just put the eyelashes and eyeball back into place since I only moved it on the Y axis. So with the hair also had to make some further adjustments. My first thought was to separate it with the hook and then parent the hook to the top of the eyelid so that way I'd be able to make the character blank. But instead it ends. So that is the conclusion of the video. So if you do have any questions, do of course leave a comment. And of course, thank you all for subscribing. And with that, happy blendering.